Glad you're here. Good morning. Welcome. If you're joining us online, glad that you're a part of our service today. Uh, we are uh, beginning a new series next week because it's a new year and a new decade. That doesn't happen very often, right? And so we wanted to lay the foundation of, you know, what do you need in your life to kind of get it right so that your next year, your next decade is all that God has for you. So we're, today's fresh start, but, but we're going to talk about what's next. What's next? What do I need to do in my life? Everybody here, including myself, everybody here has a next step. No matter where you're at, you're on a journey and everybody has a next step. So we're going to talk about what's next for you. What's our next step in our journey so that we have an amazing new year and new decade. So you'll certainly want to be part of that. You have an invite card. It should be, uh, as you came in, it should have been on your seat. Uh, and make sure to invite somebody. I was talking to somebody yesterday uh, in our church. She was saying she was working on Saturday. She had this invite card, and she was talking to one of her fellow uh, employees, uh, and he was talking about how uh, he was in a difficult place, wasn't sure about the new year, and she gave him this card. He goes, hey, this is exactly what I need. So, you know, I mean, if you look for an opportunity, God will give it to you. And so just be ready and be praying and say, God, give me an opportunity. So don't just come for yourself. Invite somebody. Bring somebody, certainly. So that's what we uh, are going to be doing starting next week. And we're going to start, uh, or what we do every year is 21 days of prayer and fasting. That's in the, just from the 5th to the 25th, 21 days. And I know last year we kind of did something different where we all did the same thing. But normally what we do is we ask you to be prayerful about something you could go without for 21 days, and I know that doesn't, you know, that doesn't go over too well in America, right? We're not into going without anything, you know, but you know, there's something to be said about uh, going without so that you could get closer to God. So this is the question you ask yourself, what could I give up for 21 days? We're not talking forever, right? For 21 days that if in its place, I could put God in there and I would, it would cause me to get closer to God. That will set a great pace for you as you go into the new year. So we're going to do that together. You can be praying about that. And, uh, and, and, we'll, and, you know, when you do stuff like that together, it's certainly better, right? It's easier when you can do it. You know, hey, you're not suffering alone. So we'll be suffering with you, okay? So, so be praying about that. Well, you know, going into this new year, we are talking about how to get a fresh start, because sometimes we need that. Sometimes we really, really need that. Some of you had a pretty rough 2019, and maybe even beyond that. And, uh, and you're saying, you know what, I, I don't want a repeat of that. I need a fresh start. I need a new beginning. When you've had a big setback, when, you, when, the, when the floor has opened up and you've fallen through, and you've had the pain of a failed relationship or a business, or all kinds of things. I mean, God wants you to, to have a great life, and he wants you to have a, a fresh start. I believe that, and we're going to look at what God says about that and how to get that. So let's look at the very first verse on your outline. Of course, I have it on the screen as well. Uh, the Lord says, forget. I love that. Right off the bat, you know, God says, what does God say? God says, what? Forget. Yeah, he says, forget. Forget what has happened before. And do not think about the past. Look at the new thing I'm going to do f f f through you. Listen, you, it's hard for us to really move forward when you're focused on the past. And God knows that about us. And he's saying, hey, I'm more interested in where you're going. Where you, I, God says, I'm more interested in your future than your past. Why? Because that's where the rest of your life is. And God's interested in your life. And so getting past that stuff that holds us back, that is so important. Not easy to do, but important. And if you're going to have the fresh start that God has for you, you're going to have to be able to let some of that stuff go. You're going to say, I'm putting that behind me. I'm not going to let that continue to just hover over me. Let, let's take the word start. And that will be kind of our formula for today. On using the word start, let's look at what does God say about how to have a fresh start. Well, number one is to stop making excuses for my failures. I mean, we all have failures. We all make mistakes. We all have things that set us back. Our go-to for most of us, because it's human nature, probably all of us, right, is excuses. We, you know, and we, we get caught up in spinning around and around uh, excuses. Well, this is why that happened. This is why, instead of, 
instead of stepping into it and saying, I'm not gonna, I'm not gonna be a victim in this deal. And now let me just be clear. People can hurt you. People can cause you pain. People can even cause you scars. But nobody can ruin your life without your permission. You get to choose that. So you don't have to stay in a place where, hey, my life's ruined. It's over. No, no. God is a God of second chances. And you can have a fresh start, but you've got to stop making excuses. It says a man who refuses to admit his mistakes can never be successful. But if he confesses and forsakes them, he gets another chance. And so there's a place where we just can't keep blaming other people for the things. Because in many cases, we, we have a percentage of stuff that we contributed. It might not be 100%, but there's a part of it. But we just fall into, we're blaming, I blame the government. If only the politicians, if only my wife had done, if only my husband, or my girlfriend, or my, you know, only my boss, if only this, only the environment. We, I mean, we have an unlimited capacity to make up reasons and excuses instead of owning that and saying, you know what, I'm going to own the part that I played in this whole thing. Now, let me give you some common causes for failure. First thing is we don't plan ahead. Certainly not planning ahead will cause problems in our lives. And a lot of us fall into that. We're, we're not, we, don't, we don't have foresight. We're just caught up in the urgency of the moment or we're caught up in the pain of the moment. And those things cause us to look inward. We don't really look outward and we're unable to plan ahead. A sensible man watches for, or woman, right? A sensible person watches for problems ahead and prepares to meet them. The simpleton never looks and suffers the consequences. So do you want to be a sensible or a simpleton? <laughs> he says it really has a lot to do with, are you looking ahead? Are you looking down the road? Uh, Noah, he had to look down the road. God had given him assignment to build an ark along with his family. In, the, in that region he was in at that time, the Bible says it didn't really, there was no rain. The water, the, the earth watered itself through a mist. People lived longer for other reasons. And, and so he has this project that's going to take him 120 years. That's planning ahead, right? Let me think, you know, it's, you know he'd never seen rain. He's got he's to stay, stay focused. Uh, Jesus tells a story about a man who was going to build a tower, and he didn't think it through well, and so he ran out of resources. And so, you know, he, he gets halfway up, and he run, runs out of resources. And Jesus says, don't be like that guy. He also gives an example of, of a military commander who goes to battle but doesn't think through what he'll need and how to resource his troops and the human resources and all those things. And so he, 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 he doesn't do well. So planning ahead certainly is part of that. Also, we don't listen to others. I mean, there's advice all around, and some of it's good. Some of it's helpful. Some of it's from people. Some of it's from God. But we don't listen to others, and so... Uh, we get caught up and, 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 and we fail. It says plans fail without good advice, but they succeed with the advice of many others. When you get advice from others, you are more likely to succeed. We all need that help. And uh, the reason most of us don't listen to others is because of pride, right? I mean, we, we, we discount, oh, they're too young. They don't have anything they can teach me. You know, or they're too old. You know, they don't have anything they can teach me. They're, they're, you know, they're, they're not educated enough. They don't have the experiences I have. Or what, and we just, instead of, that's, and that's pride. That's pride. Pride will keep us from growing in that area, from listening to people. Pride precedes destruction. An arrogant spirit appears before a fall. And so pride, pride will keep us stuck where we're at because we won't want to listen to people. You know, we kind of get, you know, it's ego. Ego stands for edging God out. I don't want to hear. I'm not interested. And it's like the, the, the man who's too big for his britches was eventually exposed in the end. <laughs> it's kind of a weird, dark humor, isn't it? How about this one? The lesson of the whale. When the whale gets to the top and is ready to blow, that's when he gets harpooned. So you don't want to be like the whale. Now listen, we, we often just don't listen because we... we we think we know better, or I'll figure it out on my own, or, 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 or we project onto other people, hey, you've got problems, how can, you, how, can you, how, can you, how can I learn anything from you? It's like the guy who goes to the psychiatrist, he goes, I think I have a problem. Psychiatrist goes, I can, I can help you. 
I'm going to show you some pictures. You tell me what you see, and I'll tell you your problem. God goes, okay. So the first picture that the psychiatrist holds up is a square. And the guy looks at it, and he goes, I see an apartment window. And inside the apartment is a couple making love. Psychiatrist goes, okay. So then he holds up a circle. And the guy goes, oh, yeah, I see a beautiful white beach. And that's a beach umbrella. And under the umbrella is a couple making love. (laughs) The psychiatrist, he then holds up a triangle. He goes, what do you see? He goes, I see this beautiful Native American reservation. And that's a teepee. And inside the teepee is a couple making love. Well, the psychiatrist puts the cards down. He goes, well, I I know what your problem is. He goes, you are obsessed with sex. And the guy gets wide-eyed. He goes, me obsessed with sex? You're the one showing all the dirty pictures. (laughs) It's so easy to project onto other people. We don't want to listen. Right? So if you think you are standing, the Bible warns, watch out that you do not fall. In other words, you think you're standing firm. You think, hey, that would never be me. I, I, you, know, you know, oh, I listen to people. Uh, do you? Are you really open to advice? Or do you really listen to people? Because that's important if, if you're going to get a fresh start. Then we give up too soon. It's easy to just throw in the towel and give up too soon and just say, well, I, I you know, and perseverance. It's, there's, sometimes you just need to persevere. If you give up when trouble comes, it shows that you are weak. So part of it, it just means we need to be strong. We need to power through. We need to, we, we can't, you know, we just got to keep going. There was a general who lost two thirds of the battles in the, in the American Revolution. And yet, and that was George Washington. He won the war. You know, and then there's, there's an attorney who lost uh, 10 out of the 12 races that he went when he went for office. And that became Abraham Lincoln and became president. Because he kept going. He kept going. There was a guy who came in 42nd out of 43 in his class. And then ended up conquering Europe. That was Napoleon. There was a guy who nobody would, 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 would uh, take his record, would make his label. He got rejected by every single music label, so he created his own, and that was Jay-Z. There was a guy who went to USC film school and or applied to go in, was rejected. He applied again, was rejected, never got in. That was Steven Spielberg. He ended up doing pretty good for not going to film school. John Creasy, the English author, was rejected 753 times with his first book. 750. Could you imagine that? I'm going to just try it again. Try it again. Finally, he was accepted. And then he ended up writing 600 novels after that. Many of them bestsellers and several of them made into movies. These guys have something in common. They kept going. They didn't give up. And so sometimes... In order to realize what God has for us, we got to stay in the fight. we got to keep going. Second is, is take stock of my life. You take stock. What do I have? What do I have? If you've gone through a financial failure, what do I have left? If you've gone through a relational failure, what friends do I still have? If you've gone through a moral failure, what is God still doing in my life? And you take stock of where you're at. You have experienced many things, Paul says to the Galatians, were all of those experiences wasted? I hope not. You see, the Galatians had experienced positive things as well as some big failures. And he summarized those in chapter 1 and 2. And then he's saying, hey, it's not, it's not all a waste. There's things you can learn, even from your mistakes, even things that you would think, hey, there's nothing here to learn from. And so Paul said, don't be like that. You have things that you that God is doing in your life that you, can, that you can learn from. Ask yourself three questions. None, n- number one is, is, what have I learned? In other words, uh, there's people that are 40 or 50 years or 60 years old. They don't have 40 or 50 or 60 years of experience. 
Because some of the, they don't learn. Some people, you know, they, have, they go through the same thing over and over. And so they only have 20 years of experience when they should have 50. And so you got to be, you gotta, so am I learning? Am I learning in this process? What are my assets? Do you still have your health? Do you still have your freedom? Do you still have your mental sanity? You know, what do you have? Do you have the Lord? Do you have a church that supports you? And then who can help me? Who can help me? Because part of what we need is people alongside us. If you've gone through a difficult place, you're not going to get out of that place by yourself. You need support of people. That's why we have small groups. We talk about it all the time. There's a small group, people that come alongside you, pray for you, are, are concerned about you, uh, encourage you, speak life into you, life-giving relationships. Very, very important. Who can help me? So that's very, very vital. It's, you know, trusting that God's going to bring. Now, here's the thing. When you're doing uh, this thing of, of uh, taking stock of your life, what, here's the problem with that, is, is that some things that come in when we're taking stock, we're, we're evaluating it based on wrong information. Because we all have experiences, and some of those experiences were really not, were not true. Did you know that? I mean, especially when you're impressionable, like you're young, somebody says, oh, you're uncoordinated, and you've been living on that lie for years and years. A coach can say that, or somebody says, you're dumb, or you'll never amount to anything, and then we buy into that when we're young and vulnerable and impressionable, and then we live out that lie that's not true about us. That's not at all true, but we live out that because we, we have this database, and we evaluate whether things are true that come our way. Whether, whether it matches, if it lines up with, with our experiences. Let me give you a couple examples. If I were to say to you, crime doesn't pay. Now, some of you would say, maybe a lot of you would say, that's true. Crime doesn't pay. Maybe you were caught stealing as a kid, uh, you know, shoplifting or whatever. And, and it just didn't, it wasn't, it didn't work out for you. So you just decided, I'm, I'm, try, I'm not going to really be a criminal. That's not working out for me. But you know what? There might be some of you that say, that, I don't believe that. Crime does pay. I've done a lot of, you know, things, and I've gotten away with it, and it paid quite handsomely for me. See, because you have a different experience that you're evaluating things on. And here, let me give you another one. If I were to say to you, parenting is mostly fun. <laughs> some of you would say, that's true. Now, those, those people that say that are the ones that had one kid and your kid was compliant. <laughs> and some of the most arrogant, not all of them, but some of the er most arrogant parents I've, I've encountered are ones that have one kid and the kid was a great kid and they thought it was because of them. Yeah, yeah, I can give you advice. No, you needed to have another one. <laughs> another one to show it had nothing to do with you. It was their human nature. But others of you would listen to that statement, parenting is mostly fun, and you'd go, well, no, that's not my experience at all. I don't, I don't believe that statement. Because for me, you would say, parenting is difficult. There's heartache in it. There's hardship in it. It's painful. And it would be, that would be true for you because you're evaluating it. See, we all have this resource, this cranium database where we're evaluating. So when you're evaluating taking stock of your life, you're, some of those things are built on wrong information. It's not true. It's a lie. And so you have to be careful about that. And you have to say, well, what does God say about me? See, this is important because that is true. That is true. So you say, what does God say about me and my life and who I'm supposed to be? That, that trumps everything else. That leads me to the next point. Act in faith. Part of getting a fresh start is going to involve stepping out in faith. If you want to change anything in your life, it's going to really need an act of faith. Now, I'm not talking about a New Year's resolution. I know those are coming up. Some of you already got yours ready to go in three days. Okay, I'm going to say this, and this will look good, or whatever. Who knows? Well, most resolutions don't work because it's out of our own effort. Listen, you need faith if you want to see a real change in your life in your relationships, in anything that you want to put your, uh, your efforts into. And so, really, uh, faith is, is, is key. Jesus said it this way. According to your faith, let it be done unto you. 
Some of you, you're looking at this coming year, this coming decade. You're going to go, oh, it's just going to be more hardship, more difficulty. I can see it coming a mile away. Well, you know what? Let me just save you any trouble. That is exactly what you're going to get. Okay? You don't have to worry about it anymore. You don't have to think about it. That's coming your way. Why? Because Jesus said, according to your faith, it's going to be done unto you. That's what you're believing for. That's what you're moving towards. But if you want something different in your life, if you want a fresh start, you've got you to you approach it differently. Say, so you know what? Maybe it won't have to be the same. Maybe God can do something remarkable. Maybe he can do the miraculous and change things in my life. And maybe my new decade won't look like my last decade. And listen, that is, is exactly what God wants to do. And he can do that for you. But it will take, it will take faith. Here's a different translation. You will have what your faith expects. Some of you just need to expect something different. You need to change what you're expecting. You need to expect for greater things. And you got to get out of the pity party thing where it's just, oh, whoa, is me. Oh, so sad for me. I'm a victim. I, you know, and you just kind of roll that tape over and over and over. Life's not fair. No, it's not. Who said life is fair? God never said life is fair. Nowhere in the Bible does it say life is fair. No. There's sin all over the world. And as long as there's sin in the world, there's no fairness. But that doesn't mean you can't have what God has for you. Like I said at the beginning, you don't, nobody can ruin your life except unless you give them permission or you, you let it happen. God wants to do something big in your life. And so a big part of moving out in faith, is learning from your failures, learning from your mistakes. Hey, what can I learn from this? Because I don't want to have to repeat that. We should make plans counting on God to direct us. Counting on God to direct us. In other words, God wants to direct you, but you have to make the plans. Your, your life, in the, your future life, where you're going to go in 2020 and beyond, is going to either be by default or design. You get to design. You get to be part of it. Hey, I get to be part of it. And then God directs us through it. Or you just kind of just let other people's crisis, let other people's urgent issues, other people's interruptions control and, and sabotage all the great things that God wants to do in your life. No, no. He says, let God direct you. Let God be part of that. You, and and, and you, you set it out for a dream. Hey, God, this is my dream. You know what a dream is? A dream is what God's doing in your life. And when you put the dream on paper, we call that a goal. That's a goal. A goal is an act of faith. Have you ever thought of that? In other words, if I trust God to direct me, I believe this will happen. That We call that a goal. You put a date, you got to put an expiration. I believe by this time. That's a goal. And that becomes an act of faith. It's a spiritual thing. Think, you know, and I hope that you write some goals down. It's really important to write goals down because when you write it down, and, and really, ideally, to tell people about it. I don't just go around telling that anybody because some people might just discourage you, right? So Jesus said, don't throw your pearls before swine. Now, you might not quote that verse when you're choosing not to tell them. I'd tell you, but you're a pig, you know. <laughs> uh, that's probably not, that's not going to go over well, well. But what Jesus is saying is, is be careful about things that are precious to you, what you do with them, how you care for them. But you write down your goals. You know, only 5% of Americans write down their goals, and they're mostly, they're correlated to being the most successful people because they have taken the time. I know people that will take hours and hours, days, planning a party, but they won't take even a few minutes to plan their life or their next year. So you write down goals. You say, I don't know how to do that. You know, there's a lot of good planners out there. The one I use, I'm not, I don't get any kickbacks. The one I use is called the Full Focus Planner by Michael Hyatt. It works for me. There's tons of them out there. That one's not an online one, but, but I'm just, I only tell you that because I want you to be successful. And if that helps you, it certainly has helped me. But it, you need something that helps you. How do I write down my goals? And let me just tell you that when you write your goals down, you're not going to reach them all. Don't worry about it. Right up the, you know, in case you're wondering, what if I don't reach them? I'm already telling you straight up. You won't. But that's okay. Because 
Goals are there to help you optimize your performance. It gives you something to move towards, to be drawn towards, to get up in the morning, to have fire in your bones, and to be excited. So you move towards that goal. You write it down. It's very important. You write, hey, this is what I believe God wants to do in my life. I love this quote by our old president, Theodore Roosevelt. He said, it's not the critic who counts, not the man who points out the strong man, how the strong man stumbles, or where the doer of deeds could have done better. The credit belongs to the man who is actually in the arena, who at best knows in the end the triumph of great achievement. You meet your goal. And who, at worst, if he fails, at least fails while daring to try. You, wrote, you tried something. You put out a goal. You went for it. So that his place is never, will never be with those cold, timid souls who know neither victory nor defeat. Don't be that. At least try. Try something. And try something big. Try something big. It makes a difference. One of the things that Roosevelt used to do, Theodore Roosevelt used to do, I read a biography recently. He, he used to take his kids and he would blindfold them. It was a game he played. Blindfold them, spin them around, take the blindfold off, and wherever they were pointed, they had to walk a mile, no matter what was in their way. And they had to go over it. They couldn't go around it. So if there was a tree, they had to climb over the tree. If there was a wall, a, a, a pool of water, whatever, and that was his game he played with him because he said, that's like life. You don't know how, what's going to come your way, and there's no going around it. That was true for Moses. Moses ends up at the brink of the Red Sea, a dead end, and he's the leader of the Israelites. And he's got Egypt, the Egyptian army on his tail. They're in hot pursuit. They're either going to kill him or enslave him, something bad. And he needs to go through the Red Sea, he probably thought of other ways. Hey, I wonder if I can get around it. You know, is there any, maybe we could build some boats and go over it. Well, that wasn't his assignment. He had to go through the Red Sea. Could you imagine when that opened up if Moses said, you go first? <laughs> <laughs> oh, okay, Moses, you get out there about a mile. Then you yell back, it's okay, Moses, come on. You're thinking to yourself, I hope the water stays up, you know. Oh, no. Some of you, going into 2020, you're going to have to go through your own Red Sea. You're going to want to go around it. You're going to want to look for other ways through, through on top or what. And God's got a mission for you, an assignment for you to go right through that problem. And he's going to be with you as you count on him. As you say, God, I need, I need you to be here. Now, a lot of times, the reason we don't share our goals is because of other people. We're just afraid of what people will say. You know, they'll, 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 they'll make us feel bad. Fear, the fear of man will prove to be a snare. That's a trap. If you let other people dictate what God has going on in your life and in your heart. Over, I guess, 33 years ago, back in 1986, 87, I was living in Tucson, Arizona. That was my hometown. I was in a church. I was, it was a large church. They had a, an apprentice program to launch uh, or to take over a church. I'd gone through that. I mean, it all green, all lights were on green for me. It looked great. And God gave me a dream to come to Virginia, where I knew nobody. I had never been to Virginia. I, I had no resources. I, had no, I didn't know anybody. But God gave me a dream. And when I told some people, some people said, that's dumb. You look at what you got here. You got a network of support. You got a church that's ready to launch you. You have all these options. But if I had listened to them, I would have missed the greatest adventure of my life. So you got to be careful. Don't let the fear of what other people say about you or think about you get in your way. Then you refocus my thoughts. Your thoughts play a vital role in what God is doing in your life and what your life is going to turn out to be. I mean, it plays a key role, your thoughts. I love this verse. It says, be careful how you think. So right off the bat, he's saying, you've got control. Certainly you've got control with God's help. As you lean on Christ, Christ will help you. But he says, be careful how you think. Your life is shaped by your what? Yeah, by your thoughts. How are you thinking? Your thinking plays the biggest role in your life 
than anything else, how you think. A lot of times we think it's our behavior. Oh, i got to stop that behavior. I don't like that. I don't like that behavior. But listen, behavior is like the caboose. It's tied to how you're thinking. See, how you think controls how you feel. How you feel controls how you behave. If you want to change a behavior, you change your thought life, what you're thinking. And, And I've never met a feeling or an emotion that I trust. Because feelings, they go up and down, depending on what I ate. If I have low blood sugar and I need a Snickers bar, I'm acting weird. You know, it's affecting my feelings. If I didn't get enough sleep, if somebody said something that, you know, gave me a bad hair day, all those kind of, Hey, listen, feelings are legit. I get it. Feelings are important. But I don't let that dictate my future and where I'm going. No, no, I want my thoughts, how I think. And God gives you that ability to say, you craft that, you direct that. Don't let, don't fall into a pattern that, that you've had before. He says, don't be conformed to the pattern of this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. You know, pattern's just a bad habit. You know, that, that, just try to do it in your own, in your own effort, in, with, in your own, in your own uh, person, and uh, the world's way of doing things. And we've all tried that. He says, no, if you want something different in 2020, in this next decade, he goes, you got to renew your mind. There's got to be a renewing of your mind, a transforming. It's God's changing your mind. How does that happen? Well, let me give you three ways. Number one is it through confession. You just admit, hey, I've been doing it wrong. I, I, this hasn't worked. I've, I, haven't done, I haven't gone to God to help him show me the way I should see myself to draw from him the energy and the effort and the wisdom that I need from others. And the things that, you just confess it. And you you go, Andy, I've confessed, I still feel bad. Well, it's, it's not only confession, it's refocusing on something else. Confession's good, but you don't stop there. Now, you focus on something else. And the best thing that you can focus on is certainly God's word. It's not the only thing, it's the best thing. It says, the law of the Lord makes them happy makes them happy or blessed, and they think about it day and night. Key phrase, we'll come right back to that. They are like trees growing beside a stream and always have leaves. That's kind of cool. I mean, a tree always having leaves. Why? Because, Because it's planted right. It's always got water. These people succeed in everything they do. That's what most of the world is looking for. They want to be happy. They want to be successful. And God says, I want that for you, but here's how you get it. How do you get it? That key phrase, they think about God's word day and night. The law of the Lord, that's the Bible. He says, God's word, you spend time in God's word. Now, we talk about that here in in the vineyard because it's important that you read your Bible, that you get up. If you're not currently reading your Bible, you download an app, go buy a Bible, whatever you need. We have Bibles here, we'll give you one, just go ask the information desk. And start reading it. And if you're not reading it at all, start by just reading it like five minutes a day. God can do a lot in five minutes a day where you just prayerfully go to God. You notice it doesn't say that you'll be happy and successful by reading your Bible. It doesn't say that you'll be happy and successful by listening to your Bible. It says you'll be happy and successful when you think about it day and night. Day and night. You know what another word for that is? Meditating. Meditation. When we meditate on God's word, that's the third thing. Meditate on God's word. You go, Andy, what's meditation? You know, some of you, you might think, you know, it's like sitting in a lotus position with your feet crossed and your arms, you know, and you, um, you know, saying some kind of word, you know, emptying your mind. No, no. And what the Bible's talking about when it's talking about meditating is, is that one translation where it said, you think about it day and in other words, you think, God, what are the implica- implications of this for my life? How should I respond? It is better to read just for one minute, just one verse, and think about it and ponder it throughout the day than reading the Bible for a whole hour, and then you forget about it. It goes in one ear, out the other ear. No, that's not how you become happy and successful. It's by meditating on it. And so you think, God, help make this a reality in my life. Help me to become more like you through this, and you start to respond. That's the key. And you go, Andy, I'm not sure. I'm not, a, I mean, that sounds so spiritual. I'm not a big meditator. Well, I beg to disagree. 
I think everybody here is an expert meditator. You're just meditating on the wrong thing. Let me ask you, how many of you can worry? Yeah, okay. There was the other half are lying, but that's fine. <laughs> we all can worry. What is worrying? Worrying is thinking about something all day long. It keeps coming back to you. <clears throat> and it's stinking thinking. It's, hey, I, this thing's going to go wrong. That thing's going to go wrong. It's not going to come through. This is going to happen. And, and, and so that's meditating just in the negative. And so God says, what I want you to do is refocus and think about the positive, what God has. And for some of us, we have very little resource to dip into for that. How do I think about positive things? I, and yet, I don't, I'm not saying just make up stuff. I'm not saying go into some kind of fantasy land and just, you know, just pretend. No, I'm saying you go to God's word. That is truth. You go, oh, so I meditate on God's word. Out of that comes satisfaction, happiness, blessed, and then and, and also being uh, successful. And then trust God to help me succeed. Trust God. You can try or you can trust. And a lot of people just try. I'll just try harder. Just try harder. People do that even in religion. You know, people do that even with Christianity. They'll just try harder. And it can look like somebody else who's not operating. They're trusting. It looks, if you just look at a distance, you can think, well, they're all doing the same thing. But listen, I'm telling you, there is a world of difference between trying and trusting. When you try, there's very little joy in that. There's nothing life-giving. It's just rote. You're just going through the motions. When you're trusting, you've plugged in to the life-giving power of Christ. And you're doing what you're doing out of a love relationship with Him, out of a close relationship and a trust relationship. When you go into, you're not worried anymore. You don't worry about your future and how everything's going to roll out. It's not all up to you. God is playing a central role in your life. And you trust, God, you will do this. You, that's what trust is. I trust that God will come through for me. You will not succeed by your own strength, amen, or your own power, but by my spirit, says the Lord. God says it's through his spirit, leaning into him. Listen, 2020, for some of you, unfortunately, will be just like 2019. Because Jesus said, according to your faith, it will be done unto you. But that's not God's best for you. I'm telling you right now, that is not God's best. His best is that you trust him. That you, learn, that you try not to succeed in your relationships, in your business, in your education, all the things you're pursuing, your, whatever it is, by your own strength and your own power. That you decide, I'm going to pursue a dream that God put in. Maybe for some of you, you gave up on a dream years ago and you think it's done. But listen, God is a God of second chances. Jonah is a great example of that. God goes to Jonah, says, this is what I want you to do. Jonah goes, no, thank you. He actually leaves and goes the opposite direction. And so God gets him on a Mediterranean cruise. And in that cruise, there's some bad weather. He ends up in the water in a tough, difficult place. And you know, there's a great promise in Jonah. It's, you can read it on your own. Jonah chapter, one, verse, chapter 3, verse 1. It says, then God spoke a second time. To Jonah. In other words, I still want to use you, Jonah. Even though you ran from me, even though you lied, even though you did this, even though you, 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 did, you didn't want to do my mission for you. He goes, I still have a plan for you. And listen, that is God's plan for you. Some of you, you've been running from God. And he says, and he's been in hot pursuit of you. You know, God sends the hounds of heaven. And they're, hoo, 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 and you're running and you're running. <laughs> you think you're t and listen, I can tell you, when, is, is, when you're running, you're miserable because that's not what you were supposed to do with your life. You were supposed to be working alongside with God, doing his plan for your life, leaning into him, trusting him, evaluating your life based on his truth. And this is your moment. I mean, there's defining moments in life. There's just no doubt about it. Defining moments. I believe this is a defining moment. 
And for some of you, it's your key defining moment. Going into this new year, you, and you don't have to do it. God will never force you to do anything. But listen, you will never be happy. You will never be filled with joy. You will never have that life-giving relationship with God as long as you're on the lamb. I love this last verse. It says, when someone becomes a Christian, he becomes a brand new person inside. God does something remarkable that only he can do. He is not the same anymore. A new life, that's a fresh start. A new life has begun. That's what God offers. That's what he says. I want that for you. I want you to have a fresh start. And some of you, that's God's invitation to you right here, right now. Okay, let's bow our heads and we'll pray. I'm just going to invite you, if you would, every eye closed, every head bowed in this moment. This is an important moment. You know, some people, literally, their lives hang in the balance. What their lives are going to turn out, what it's going to be like. And so, Lord, I know that you say, according to our faith, it will happen to us. It'll be done into our lives. And so, Lord, I just pray that you increase everybody's faith right now. Lord, I pray for for whatever step somebody's at spiritually, that they have the courage and the tenacity and the wherewithal to take their next step. Everybody here probably has a different next step. But everybody has a next step. And so, Lord, I pray that you give each one, right now, you can just, in your heart, say, God, I want to take that next step. Would you do that? I want to take that next step. Now, the Bible says, if you're far from him, your next step is praying and saying, God, I want to follow you. I want Jesus. I want the fresh start that God offers through Christ. And that's an invitation. I'm going to pray for some of you not to join the church, but to join Jesus, to say yes to God. This isn't anything about joining a church. This is about getting right with God and saying yes to God. I want to be right with God. So I'm not going to ask you to stand up or come forward. I'm going to ask, I'm going to invite you to pray right now, right where you're at, and say, I want more of Jesus. And so if that's you, you're saying, I want to go into this new year, this new decade, and I want I want to get right with God, then I want to pray with you. And if that's you, I want you to just boldly and courageously, right where you're at, to just raise your hand up and show me, okay? Would you do that? Just raise your hand. Bless you. Bless you. Yep. A number. The Lord bless you. I see in the back a number of you. Somebody else? Anybody else? Say, that's me. I want that fresh start. It's not too late. Just slip your hand up. Okay. You can put your hand down. I want you to pray with me. Just say this, just whisper it or say it in your heart, whatever you feel comfortable with. Say, God, I want a fresh start. And I confess that I've tried to do it on my own. And I'm miserable. You say, God, I want to follow you. I want to trust you. I want to believe the truth about me that you say is true. You say, God, give me a new way of looking at things and begin that work of transforming my mind and my thoughts. In Jesus' name, amen. Well, I just, if you prayed with me, I want to just congratulate you. An amazing decision. Would you just applaud with me? Just say, yeah, that's our support.